For those of you who aren't, so Fort Ross was the furthest down that the Russians came. And of course, they were in Alaska, and so they, they were actually amazingly looking for somewhere where they could grow food and ship it all the way up to Alaska, and and that um, didn't work very great. <laughs> but there were sea otters in that area, so they um, so they hunted sea otters uh, at the time. And so they founded a, a little fort that had about 200, 300 people. And at the time, that was more people than San Francisco had. And this was in the early 1800s. If you need a light, uh, um, are you OK? Or do you want the light on? Yeah. You OK? OK. Um, so anyway, so, um, <clears throat> so they built um, in, the, in the fort, um, they built a chapel. And it was actually the people who lived there. Uh, who built the chapel. Uh, they were uh, Russians, Native Alaskans, and Native Californians who had become Orthodox. And, um, and so this chapel, the reason I'm saying that is that this chapel is a replica. Um, the structure is, they don't really know what the inside looked like. But this is a replica of the uh, Fort Ross Chapel. Uh, so it's, um, the, so there's a, a beautiful history here because that's, as far as we know, like um, so on the West Coast, that was the first Orthodox, um, um, you know, chapel, and this is the first Orthodox women's monastery. And so this was built in 1959. And uh, if you see on the other side of this beam here, there's a plank. Yeah, and, yes. and that plank is um, the original 19, uh, uh, the original. Um, yeah, the chapel other side. at Fort Ross was fell in the in the great oh, earthquake okay. of 1906. Um, and so we anyway, so have that added extra um, There's a lot we actually don't know about this chapel uh, or or even this this place because unfortunately a lot of the records are lost. So uh, I'm not 100 percent sure of everything, but I can just tell you you know the things I've heard. So the iconostas. Um, was done by uh, one of the earlier nuns, and the um, the dome. There was a I can't remember her name, but she was a very well known Russian iconographer who lived in New York in the early in, in the 1970s, and so she uh, she did that in the 1970s. Um, <coughs> we have um, we have many. Um, for, for such a small place, we have quite a few um, relics. Um, uh, behind you all, uh, there's Saint Pantalaimon. Uh, that's the more you know Western-looking icon there. Um, that's one of the earliest icons we have. I mean, earliest relics we have because he um, died in the Diocletian persecutions. 
Uh, next to him, this is St. Nicholas of Japan, who was a Japanese, a Russian missionary to Japan. Uh, he was lived about the same time as St. Innocent of Alaska. Uh, and something is, so we have, not only do we have his relics, that is the actual icon that was painted for when he was recognized and recognized as a saint. So that's uh, a completely irreplaceable um, icon. And something that's been sort of interesting here is that uh, Japanese people just sort of accidentally have been walking in here, and and they've actually been to his cathedral, and they didn't know, they didn't even know who he was. And it seems like he's just reaching out to Japanese people here. It's just been quite interesting to watch. Um, we have, let's see, so we have, um, uh, oh, I'll tell you over here. So our relics, um, we have St. Sarah from the Sarah, St. Victorious of Agina, uh, Patriarch uh, Tikhon of Moscow, St. Herman of Alaska, St. Uh, Innocent of Alaska, uh, St. Daniel of Moscow, who was the the Prince of Moscow at the time when it, it wasn't, it was still a very little village. Uh, and it was through him, and it's a long story, but uh, that it was the beginning of its becoming great. And he, he died a monk. He was a very holy and good ruler. Um, and as many good holy rulers did, they ended their lives as monks because it's, it's hard to be a ruler and there's much to repent for even if you're just the best. Uh, and so behind here we have St. Ambrosi of Optina, who's one of the greatest of the Optina elders. Uh, the small icon uh, next to him is St. John Maximovich, uh, who I'm sure you know, um, whose relics are in San Francisco. Uh, we have this, this next icon, this is very interesting because the icon is St. Sabatius of Solo P, <coughs> but the relics, or of St. John the Long Suffering in the Kiev Caves. And we don't know the story of why the relics, and they lived at different times and in very different places. Uh, so we don't know that story. This is St. Barbara the Great Martyr. And then that's St. Nicholas of Zicha. And so those are our, um, our relics. Um, we, if you see over in this corner, you see there's a a small icon with a big red um, background. That's also St. Barbara, and there's a special story to that. And I'll start by telling you like how we got here. So the the early um, the the first nuns here, there were never many of them, and a lot of them were old. And so you know, bit by bit, they you know they got sick, they died, uh, and various things happened. And so by the early 1980s, there were no nuns here anymore. And this was functioning just like a parish church. Um, and then, so, you know, it's only, it's not that big, but it's not easy to keep up. And so when there were no longer nuns here, there was either just a married uh, priest and his wife, or just a priest monk, and everything was falling apart. So they sent a priest here in, in the late 1980s to start getting things back together. Uh, and so they had just gotten to the point where the main house where we, where we just ate, they were able to, uh, it was just getting ready to where somebody could live in it. And we, we come from Southern California, our, most of the sisters here, we came here together. And what uh, we were, we had, um, we had had to move from the Santa Barbara area to Santa Paula, which is like near Ojai, Ventura, Oxnard. And um, <coughs> so most of the sisters were living in RVs. And we didn't know that wasn't legal. <laughs> And so what happened, one of the, you know, somebody went to the county and we were talking about it and they go, oh, don't tell us, we don't want to know because, you know, they didn't want to have to, to kick us out. And they were very, very nice. But then what happened was we were actually given some money to build a chapel and then they had to come out officially. And then they couldn't pretend they didn't see, like we had like 17 RVs. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so anyway, so they gave us, 
30 days to get rid of all the RVs, which meant 30 days to get rid of two-thirds of the community because 11 of the sisters were living in the RVs and the others were for other purposes. Um, and by the grace of God, this area, this, you know, this had, was just getting ready when, when we were out of the home. And so we were, um, we were here two weeks from the day we found out we actually had to move. Uh, and another thing that's really beautiful about this is we do everything together with the little um, Brokor Church, you know, Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, which is just found the way here. And they had not had a priest for three years. And they got a new priest one week before we got here. And then, then what happened was, like, the priest who was here, uh, he ended up having to spend a lot of time in Berkeley because the priest there was, was very sick and dying. And so a lot of the time we didn't have a priest. And Father Joachim over there didn't have a choir because his choir was his mother and the choir director who had bad eyes and couldn't drive over the mountain from Santa, uh, Santa Rosa during the uh, evening for pre-sanctified liturgies. So we just got the blessings of our bishops and we, we started to be in his choir. And then he's like, well, I'd like to do something for you. So then he started serving here in, on weekdays. And so um, so a year later was when, like that Pascha we did celebrate together, but then we were still you know, doing Sundays separate. And then a year after that was when we started doing everything together. And it's, it's very interesting because we're a new calendar and of course they're old calendar. You know, and it's it's the kind of thing you don't set out to say, let's go do this. But God put us together, and it's been it's been very wonderful. So we really love it here. So anyway, getting back to, to St. Barbara, we came from St. Barbara Monastery, and uh, Archbishop Benjamin, for many years, was the local tenant of the um, uh, Diocese of Alaska. And so he just so happened, like right after we got here, he was up in Alaska at the cathedral in Kodiak, and they were going through all these old icons, and this icon was damaged. So they were going to burn her. And so Archbishop Benjamin said, no, don't burn her. Let's take her to the sisters at Holy Assumption Monastery. And so for us, that was just really special because it was like her way of saying she hadn't forgotten us. So, so that was a real blessing. And um, I have almost no sense of smell, so I can't tell you this personally. But one of the sisters was mentioning to me that like, for months there was a, a fragrance coming from that, that icon. And so that's probably early 1800s, late 1700s. Um, this icon here, you know, which is this very western looking one, we just got this like less than a week ago. And there was a, a Russian woman and her husband who came by and said that um, her, her, I think she said it was her great, great grandmother, you know, had rescued it like during Bolshevik times. And, um, and in, you know, and, and I'm sure, as you know, you know, um, to hold on to an icon under the communists was to take your life into your hands. And so, you know, they held on to it for all these decades, uh, and she graced us with, with that, and so a, a, a great blessing. Um, <coughs> the, uh, let's see, do we have, yeah, okay, yeah, this icon, which usually sits here, uh, this is probably the oldest icon we have, and um, Mother Serafima, our iconographer, thinks it is probably from the 15th century. Um, so that is another blessing. And then uh, somebody was mentioning about our St. Nicholas icon. <coughs> so this icon, um, the, uh, I don't know what you would call it in Romania, but we call it the Riza, the, the overlay. Mm -hmm. um, so, and if you look at most of the rest of our icons with, with Rizas, you see that they're very tarnished. And, and most of them, the, they've been around for a long time and their faces are very dark. And he was like that. He was very, very tarnished. And his face was so dark that you couldn't see his features. And I don't know when it happened, but 
Our Abbess Mother Victoria, she was here in the early in the 1970s, and this happened sometime before that. He just started brightening up. Um, so, you know, so uh, of course that's not real common, but it's common enough that there's a name, so they call them the self-renewing icons. Uh, so, so anyway, so that's why there's all the uh, the jewelry there, you know. So people come and they ask his prayers. Um, interestingly, the the three people I've met who've told stories uh, related to miracles with this, two of them were women who were unable to have children, and in the one case, like she was like physically just completely unable to have children, so that when she got pregnant, the doctors didn't even think to look for that because like, there was no way she could be pregnant and her daughter's about 30 years old now. Um, but then, and then the other lady was a similar story <coughs> and that was maybe about 10 or 15 years ago. And then the, the third story <coughs> was, um, you know, right, right after the Iron Curtain started to open up, there was a, a Russian, an American-Russian uh, deacon and his wife who had I don't know how they did, but they had enough clout in in Russia that they were able to go and um, a, uh, adopt a child. And this was the first time that anybody, you know, had been adopted out from, you know, from one side of the Iron Curtain to the other. And so they, before they started, they came and they prayed in front of St. Nicholas. And, and of course there was immense red tape. So like every time they, they went and they were at a place where there, it was just didn't look like it was going to keep happening, they would go and they would pray at a church of St. Nicholas or a shrine of St. Nicholas and then the next thing would happen and finally they got it, everything finished and they're taking the little girl home and it was St. Nicholas Day. <laughs> so uh, so that, that's a very great uh, blessing. Um, so that's most of... The, you know, there's many stories, um, but if, if you, does anyone have any particular stories about the monastery, questions about the monastery that you would want to ask, or about any of the icons? How many nuns are living here right now? There, there are, t including novices, there's 12, and then there's a young woman living with us who's hoping to become a nun, so there's 13, 13. altogether. Yeah. So what is the, the monastery is living, uh, is, is it's making candles, or what is doing the monastery? Because I know it's doing something. Uh, yeah. So um, we um, we bake, we, we do bake goods for the farmers market down the way. That's like one of our main things that we do. Uh, we have children's books. Uh, we have um, we actually we sell caskets. You know. Yes. Um, yeah. So we do that, and that's actually a. Th that's a real privilege for us to be able to do, you know, because, you know, when people are towards the end of their lives, um, or your loved ones have died, and it's, it's a real privilege to be able to, you know, to work with people and pray with people uh, during that time. And so um, that, that has been a, a real blessing for us. Um, and of course we get a lot of uh, donations. Um, but those are sort of the those are sort of the main things that we, we do. The caskets was one of the things that I have in mind. I want you to say it. I'm sorry. The caskets. Oh yeah, the caskets. Yes. So I think there's some brochures around. And if anyone wanted to see, we do have. We basically only have pine caskets right now. Um, but if anyone wanted to see, it's, uh, one of the sisters can show you. Um, any other particular? Do you have rooms to host people here? Um, yeah, you know, for women, yes. Um, we don't have a lot of room. Like usually, we have one or two rooms available for women. Uh, if um, if families or men want to come, our neighbors next door have a little um, like bed and breakfast. Yeah, they have cottages, and they're. Like nothing's cheap in Calistoga, so like they're they're like like they'll give during the week they'll give like eighty five dollars a, a, a night, which in Calistoga is like really 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 good. But yeah, <laughs> but and you can in some of their cottages you can actually get about four people in the cottage, so it's it's actually fairly reasonable, and they're lovely people. They're, 
Yes. Yeah. And that, that's another thing. People have been so kind to us in Calistoga, you know, because there had been nuns here for a very long time. And so the, the older people remember this, the first nun. And then Father Sergius, who was here when we got here, he was always telling people, nuns are coming, nuns are coming. So when we got here, people, you know, they would, we'd be walking downtown and they'd roll their windows down in their cars and say, oh, it's so wonderful to finally have nuns again, and, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, people would come and just, you know, if the sisters were carrying something heavy through the gates, people would just stop their cars and get out and help us. And that used to be common in the United States, but it's not anymore, you know, and so, and and it's sometimes when things aren't common, it's nice because then you can be much more appreciative of things. You should have been appreciative all along, you know, but you, you don't realize it. Uh, so anyway, um, I don't know what your time frame is as far as, you know, like if you didn't have any more questions. Um, I actually have a little a kid story. Please. Okay. Uh, you know, and some of you may have seen that we do um, like animal fables. You know, the point being like, how do you talk to children about virtues without like pushing it down their throats? You know, so <clears throat> we started this uh, group of stories about a a duck who was like a fireman, so he was a fire duck. And then he had all these different friends, that, and then they get into trouble because they weren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so this particular story, uh, which isn't published yet, but um, this, it's about it's about Lent and like all the ridiculously stupid things we do when we don't approach Lent right, and then how you would approach Lent right. So um, <clears throat> anyway, and it goes. Like it was Lent as a duck pond and Rigid Rooster was having a good Lent. At least he thought he was having a good Lent. He knew all the rules and he kept them, and he made sure everyone knew that he kept them, and he thought it was his job to make sure everyone else kept them too. Capers the cat paid no attention to Lent. I have to drink milk every day, he would say. How else can my beautiful orange coat keep it cheap? And I don't have time to make special meals for myself. And anyway, look at Rigid Rooster. If keeping Lent makes me like that, I'm much better off the way I am. One day, Rigid was going to visit Henry Hamster, who was sick with a bad cold. On his way, Rigid happened to see Capers the cat drinking a bowl of milk. Capers, cried Rigid, shocked. It's Lent. You shouldn't be drinking milk. Capers didn't even bother answering him. He just kept drinking his milk and muttering to himself, I'm glad I'm not like that. Soon Rigid arrived at Henry's house. Henry said Rigid, I brought you a vaporizer. You know how easily hamsters get pneumonia. Thanks, Rigid, said Henry. That was kind of you. Rigid thought the same thing. He smiled and said, well, I try to do extra good deeds in Lent. It's important, you know. If I were Henry, I'd have gotten mad at Rigid. But Henry just smiled and thanked Richard again, and then he asked him if he would like to stay a little while. No thanks, Henry, Richard said. I have a long list of other good deeds I need to do. I'll see you later. Okay, Henry smiled and thanks again. Shortly after Richard left, Charity the church mouse came by, carrying a thermos of soup. Hi, Henry, Charity said. I thought this might help warm you up. Henry thanked her and asked her to sit down. Charity was never too busy to spend time with a friend. So she sat a while with Henry. Right away, she noticed that he didn't have a coat or a blanket. He was too poor. The next day, the mailman arrived at the door with a warm new coat and a woolen blanket. There was no note and no name on the package, but Henry was pretty sure who had sent them. As he put them on, he thought of Charity's threadbare coat. God bless Charity, he said with tears in his eyes. Lent continued. Rigid kept following all the rules. He did even more than the rules said. He did more prostrations, ate less, and drank less than all the other animals. He got more and more tired, but he didn't stop. He wanted this to be his best Lent ever. Chambers kept doing what he always did. He ate what he liked and did whatever he wanted whenever he wanted. Henry was sick for the rest of Lent. 
His doctor told him he needed milk and oil and other foods to help make him well. And he was too sick to do much for anybody, but he was thankful. Charity visited Henry every day. She always brought him a thermos of soup. And whenever he needed anything, it always showed up on his doorstep. Charity didn't think she was doing a good deed, though. She admired him and was grateful to have him as a friend. Finally, Pasca came. All the animals waited outside the church. Fearless the fire duck was there, ready to put out any fires caused by animals setting their hair on fire with their candles. Polly the paramedic parrot was there. Charity and Henry were there too. Henry was still sick, but he was well enough now that Charity was able to bring him to church in a wheelchair. The whole duck pond was there, all except Capers and Bridget. Maybe you're not very surprised that Capers wasn't there, but what about Bridget? Charity noticed that Capers and Bridget were missing, so she asked Fearless to stay with Henry and got Polly to come with her. First they went to Bridget's house. He had passed out from not eating or drinking enough. Polly took him to the hospital where he had to stay for several days till he was better. While Polly took Bridget to the hospital, Charity went looking for Capers. He was sitting in his house, looking a little lonesome. Why don't you come to church, Capers, asked Charity. If anyone else had asked that, Capers would just have laughed, but he loved Charity. So he said, well, I don't really like going to church, but I'll come because you asked. Capers and Charity got back to the church just in time to see the people come out. All the animals followed the procession, carrying their candles. Charity couldn't hold a candle because she needed both hands to push Henry's wheelchair. And Henry was still too weak to hold a candle. But they didn't need candles. Their faces were brighter than candles. After the people went back into the church, the animals crowded around the window so that they could hear what was happening. And this is what they heard. If anyone has labored from the first hour, let him today receive his just reward. If anyone has come at the third hour, with thanksgiving let him keep the feast. If anyone has arrived at the sixth hour, let him have no misgivings, for he shall suffer no loss. If anyone has delayed until the ninth hour, let him draw near without hesitation. If anyone has arrived even at the eleventh hour, let him not fear on account of his delay. Capers brushed away a tear. He looked at the bright faces of his friends. They were so bright that he couldn't look at them very long. He turned to Charity and said, I don't deserve to be here, but thank you for inviting me. And then, though he didn't know it, his face became as bright as theirs. After church, Capers, Henry, and Charity went to see Rigid. Rigid had been thinking. Hi, Rigid, Charity said. I hope you're doing better. I'm sorry you missed Pasca. You've never missed it before. Bridget looked at the bright faces of Capers, Henry, and Charity, and his eyes watered up. No, I think I have always missed Pasca, Bridget replied. But maybe you can teach me how not to miss it next year. They all smiled. Bridget hadn't missed past Pasca after all. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, it's a Thank children's you. story, but it's, it's a beautiful a story. story too. Thank you. We all miss it one way. No, 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 don't cry. No. Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the meal. Thank you for everything. If we can, we can have the blessing to have a picture in front of the church with you and other nuns maybe or whatever you, you usually do.